So, greetings everybody. Uh, you may be wondering what you're looking at right now. Normal people use uh, like slideshow software like Keynote and PowerPoint. But uh, us functional programmers are way too cool for that. So, uh, we don't grovel on that mud, so to speak. So, off the shelf. Slideshow software. Uh, so this uh, this is an interactive thing, and what you're looking at there is a little koala bear. You may be wondering what is the significance of a koala bear. And the answer is that was the quickest image I could steal from the internet <laughs> for the purposes of this little game here. Uh, he doesn't do anything, there's no goal to this game. He jumps very high though, so that's <laughs> only because I mistaking koala bears for kangaroos and it was too late to change it. So uh, we're gonna have to deal with that. Uh, yeah, functional game development. You know, uh, functional programming is uh, already quite popular in other areas of the programming. Um, if you think about like back end developers, for example. You find a back-end developer in the wild somewhere, in a cubicle or in his bedroom. You know, you have, like, spear a path through all the empty stood hands and regrets. Uh, and you ask him or her, like, what, is, what are you excited about, uh, technologically speaking? In 2016, a lot of them are going to say stuff like Elixir, Closure, Haskell. And that's mind blowing. Five years ago, ten years ago, uh, you would not have heard that. Same thing with front end developers. You talk to them uh, when they're not working, which is normally the case. They're uh, they're going to say they're excited about Elm. They're excited about Closure Script. Uh, the more conservative ones who are still inexplicably using JavaScript are going to say they're using React. They're using Immutable JS. So even they are. Uh, uh, doing some functional programming. Uh, but game development is a different story. Uh, my first game I made when I was 15, it was a little text game in C++. And I've been doing nothing but hobbyist stuff since then. I've never worked for a, a game studio or anything like that. Uh, but I've talked to tons of game developers in person and online, and uh, none of them are doing that. None of them are doing functional programming, or very few of them are. I might be getting little bits and pieces of concepts. Um, they're not really doing it. The question is why. Uh, a couple days ago, I Googled functional game development so I could pretend like I knew what I was talking about. And I came, on, <coughs> came across this. It's a core question. Is functional programming suitable for game development? I was planning on just reading one of these answers and just letting that be the talk. Uh, <laughs> And I read through it and uh, came across one guy. I was like, oh, I struck gold, professional game developer. And his answer was uh, to the question of is functional programming appropriate for game development? He said, I don't think so. Not for anything more complicated than an Atari game remake. So we're getting somewhere. Uh, I'm not going to read all of it because it's stupid and his opinion is wrong, but let me just continue here. Uh, games have tremendous amounts of mutable state and don't lend themselves to lots of concurrency because of the dynamic nature of game events. Functional languages also don't have the kind of performance optimization games generally require. Uh, easy. So uh, that part actually, there's, there's some truth to that. Then he says some other dumb stuff and then he said games are hard enough to make I don't know why you'd want to make it artificially more difficult. It would be worse than shooting yourself in the foot, more like shooting yourself in the genitals. <laughs> so, professional game developer, not like functional programming. Now, first of all, whatever your opinion of functional programming, we can all agree Daniel Super is a real stupid name. <laughs> and that should detract from <coughs> his argument. Uh, no, his argument is, is valid, and I think for a long time it was really valid. Uh, functional programming imposes a cost, uh, a performance cost. 
uh, immutable data in particular, uh, it creates a lot of garbage, so to speak, that a garbage collector must clear up. Um, but this has changed a lot recently, especially in the last five years. Like I said, there's been tremendous strides in making immutable data faster. Um, and also, browsers are getting faster. The uh, Java virtual machine is getting faster. And we're at the point now where this kind of concern is just not really an issue, uh, except for maybe the top tier AAA games. Uh, not for the sort of stuff that you're going to be doing in your free time, other than uh, in a small indie studio. So I don't actually think that's the reason. It's not common right now. Um, if I were to think back to all the people I know and have spoken to who are game developers, the thing that sticks out at me is that they're extremely pragmatic people. They're not language geeks like me. And I don't blame them for that. We can't all be perfect. But they, they want to make games. That's what they want to do. Uh, they don't care about the language they're using. They don't care about whether Hacker News is impressed by the internals of their game. They just want to make a game. Uh, so uh, with that in mind, uh, when, when you think about the average game developer, they don't even really choose their language. Most of the time, they, do, they choose uh, a game engine. They choose a game framework first. And there are a lot to choose from, as I nonchalantly walk to the next slide. Here are a couple. <coughs> Anyone heard of any of these at all? Awesome. Yeah, a lot of people. So there's Unity, which is a C-sharp, or at least it, that C-sharp is the primary language that they use to make Unity games. Unity is extremely popular. Um, if you choose Unity, chances are you're going to choose C-sharp, because all the tutorials are written for it, all of the documentation is um, this GDX, same story there. It's a Java game framework. It's pretty awesome. That's the one that I used for a while. And all the tutorials, all the documentation is Java specific. So, of course, that's what they're going to use if they use it. And if you want to make web games, uh, as you would expect with JavaScript, there's no one thing. There's like 50. So, uh, here's just a couple. There's Phaser, there's Bio.js. <coughs> Lots of little libraries and things that you can use to make uh, browser based games. But again, their websites assume you're going to be doing it in JavaScript. And so, of course, uh, that's what you're going to use. So I think this is the actual reason. If there's like, when you're making a game, you're not going to start from scratch. You're going to use one of these things. And uh, at that point, it almost feels like your decision was made for you. Uh, but I, uh, I guess my per first point is that that's not the case. When you think about functional programming, you might think of uh, older languages like Haskell or Lisp, but there's a new breed of functional languages that are what we call hosted languages. They're functional languages that run on top of these platforms. So, just to give you a couple examples, we've got, uh, so we'll start with Unity. Unity is, is running on top of .NET or Mono, and uh, you don't need to use C Sharp. You can use Closure or you can use F Sharp. Just Google Unity Closure or Unity F Sharp. Tons of people are doing that. Same thing with LibGDX. You don't need to use Java. You can use Closure. You can use Scala. Uh, they run on top of the JVM. Uh, and finally, if you're, if you're doing something that interacts with a JavaScript library, you don't need to use JavaScript. You can use ClojureScript. You can use PureScript. Um, many more uh, besides that. So, I mean, I mean, there is a downside, which, like I said, you know, the tutorials are not written for these languages. So you're going to have to do a little bit of mental translation when you're reading through them. And that means these have to give you some kind of advantage, or else it's not worth the cost. And so the question is, what is the advantage of writing a game in a uh, functional language? And I'm not going to go for the normal argument. Most people, when they talk about functional programming, they talk about how pure functions are uh, inherently easier to debug, easier to understand what's going on. Um, generally, you'll have uh, fewer bugs. But, uh, oh, and also testing, they always talk about that. But game developers don't test. It doesn't even make sense. And bugs, I mean, who cares if there's a bug in your game? You just release an update on Steam, and your users will still be angry. But No, there's, there's a more important thing, I think. 
I, I can't fall through that gap or it would ruin things. So you guys got to help me out. Um, so there, there are actually much more important reasons for using functional programming languages, and that is that they're really good at this kind of stuff. And I don't really have a good umbrella term here. Maybe like uh, malleability, something like that. Functional languages are really good at things like hot code reloading, meaning like while your game's running, you can change the code without restarting the game. You know, the, uh, the code just automatically is updated. Rebel-driven de development, that just means while your game is running, connect to a little console and start running arbitrary functions or just reading uh, the text. Question? Just quick, uh, you might be getting to this, but uh, there's some uh, a lot of students in the room who a lot of them might never have done functional programming at all. I have no idea what functional programming is. Uh, yeah. So before it gets more complicated, would you mind, like, if you can, a minute or two, just, you know, saying what it is? Yeah, definitely. And that's, that's the. My intention here, uh, once we get to looking at some codes, I want to start with like a procedural or object-oriented, like work my way up, because uh, I know not everyone has done it. Um, but you know, the, the primary idea of functional programming is uh, you're not going to directly change a value. You're going to, uh, hopefully, if you've done it right, have the majority of your program not directly change values, but just return new values. So if you have a function, instead of just, you know, in an array of some kind, adding things to the end of it directly, you would just uh, essentially create an entirely new array with that thing added to the end. Uh, it'll be a little bit easier to show that when we look at some code examples. So time traveling, that literally means like being able to rewind the game. Anyone ever played Braid before the game? Yeah, a couple people, all right. Braid is really cool. Um, Braid is a game that lets you actually literally use time rewinding as a game mechanic. So it's a puzzle game where like, you're, it's a platformer like this, but you're jumping on stuff. And uh, in order to actually beat levels, you have to hit a certain button that rewinds it. Um, but in this case, I, I'm actually talking about it more as a way to debug your code and uh, discover issues. So, um, but it, it, you don't really need to worry about that right now. The bigger thing here is, uh, I think the most important thing to game development is being able to play with your code like Play-Doh. Like while the game is running, being able to mess with it. You can do this a little bit with imperative languages, uh, not just the creator of Minecraft uh, make good use of that when he was writing it, but it's a lot easier with languages like this. And, uh, and I think this is not just a small thing. It's not just, oh, I can change my code, I don't have to restart, it saves me time. It's more like, uh, it gives you more opportunities to randomly discover uh, cool ideas. If you talk to a game developer, a lot of them will say, uh, a lot of my best ideas I discovered on accident. Uh, I was playing and I, you know, I made the koala bear jump too high on accident and it ended up being fun, so I kept it there. And that kind of stuff is very normal and actually pretty unique to games. Uh, I don't, it doesn't happen that much in web development where I just accidentally screw up my CSS and. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I'm going to keep it there. Uh, but with games, it happens all the time. So if you want to increase the likelihood of having good ideas serendipitously arrive, uh, you need to use tools that let you change the code and, uh, and be able to play with it without having to restart your game or refresh your browser. So um, yeah, to that point, let's, uh, let's look at what functional programming in games actually looks like. I'm going to start, so uh, just as a background, three primary styles of programming. There's what we call procedural programming. A lot of languages like C operate that way. Just a bunch of functions, one after the other, running imperatively. Uh, the second is object-oriented programming, so that's Java. Um, a lot of the other languages like Ruby, Python are, are very object-oriented. Um, the, the last category is functional, so that's the kind that I'm talking about. So we're going to start with procedural. So what does a procedural game look like? So the code you're looking at on the left is drawn in that creepy looking smiling face. Right? <laughs> and uh, this, is this is JavaScript. Uh, this is the P5.js library. And you know it's pretty self-explanatory. You don't really even need to 
know how to code, you just like read it. You know, first create a yellow, we'll fill in the color yellow, draw an ellipse, which will draw that circle there uh, for the head. Then uh, switch the color to black, and draw the two eyeballs. And then get rid of the fill and draw that part, which is the, the mouth. Okay, so this works fine. Nothing wrong with this. Uh, for a simple picture like this. When you get into more complex games, it's going to get a lot more difficult. Um, one of the problems here is that each function here doesn't know anything about the other function. They're all just standalone functions. So uh, the positioning, that's these first two values you see in all these. The positioning is, is what we call absolute positioning, meaning uh, it's, it's all relative to like the top left corner of your screen. And that gets really hard after a while. When you uh, draw more complex images, it's all relative to the top left corner. I mean, it's going to be extremely difficult to change after a while. And so this style of programming tends to get really difficult as you get more complex. And so the first solution, the one that you know most uh, game libraries have done, is uh, switch their style to what we call an object-oriented style. And that's what you're looking at there. So this is technically doing the exact same thing that the code was doing before. It's just doing it in an object-oriented style. So first, we're creating this head object. That's the, that's the actual head. And that's this like ellipse object. <coughs> we're making it yellow. And then here's a really important part. We're adding two eyeballs and a mount to it. So we weren't doing that before. So this idea of adding objects to other objects, that's something that we get from object-oriented programming. And the advantage of that is we get this sense of hierarchy. All of a sudden, it's not just a bunch of functions standalone running one after the other. We get this hierarchy of stuff that we're building up. So when we build something really complex, it's not all absolute positioning. You can look at the numbers there. These are what we call relative positioning because we can position the eyes relative to wherever the head is. So we can build much uh, more complex um, drawings, which, especially when you get into an actual game, not just a smiley face, it's actually important. Um, what else? Oh, and also, object-oriented programming allows you to defer the drawing until the end. So whereas before, all the drawing was happening right when you call the function, in this style, nothing actually is drawn on the screen until that last line. And we'll see later why that's. Useful. But anyway, this is not functional though. Why is it not functional? Well, I'd say at least these four lines are clearly preventing it from being called that because the idea of functional programming is once you create a value, you don't change it anymore. It stays the same. So we created that head and all of a sudden we're changing it. We're setting it to yellow and then we're adding stuff to it. Those are mutations. And uh, so that's going to prevent it from really uh, enjoying the benefits of functional programming. So the question is, what would a functional style even look like? And uh, honestly, I don't, I don't know if anyone has any agreement on that. There are tons of different ways you could pursue this. But the general idea is we want to limit mutation as much as we can. So how can we do that? Well, uh, one idea, this is just one possibility, is do away with all of this crap, all of these classes, those functions you saw before, get rid of them. And instead, just create a, uh, a little, almost like an intermediary uh, description of what you want to draw as data. That's it. No functions running anywhere. Uh, uh, anyone here do any JavaScript at all? OK. So in, in JavaScript, which this is supposed to still be. I don't know if it is. I made it up. Uh, in JavaScript, you've got arrays. That's the things with the square brackets. Then you've got, uh, I don't know, objects or dictionaries, whatever they call them. Those are the things with the curly braces. In JavaScript, you use those all the time just to describe stuff. It's not really code. It's just data. It's just describing something. Um, if we could just create a, like, a, like a little chunk of data that described it, and then we had like a single God function that took it and <coughs> turned it into an image. Um, we could, in a way, claim that we are functional because we've 
we haven't really done any mutation until the very last step, that, that draw part. So what would that look like? Well, in JavaScript, and you, you have to, uh, you know, ignore how ugly this is going to look and just think about the idea. Uh, I'm going to call this data-oriented programming. <coughs> and uh, if you've seen JavaScript before, if you've ever used like JSON, that's all you're really looking at here. We're creating this variable called commands. And we're saying, okay, we're going to make an array. And here are the only rules you have to follow. The first thing in the array has to be the name of the command. The second thing has to be those, the thing we put out of braces. That has to be a little object that just has attributes that the command needs, like yellow in that case. Anything else in the array is just a subcommand. That's it. You can write those rules on a napkin and go home, and people can use it to write a game, apparently. So, uh, we have a command called fill, color yellow, so that's the attribute map. And then underneath that, we got a subcommand, ellipse, that's going to draw the circle. And then underneath that, we have a couple more subcommands for drawing the eyes, and drawing the mouth. The important thing to note all that stuff you're looking at there, those aren't functions. They're not actually doing anything, it's just data. It's just like describing what you want. There's only one function here, it's called render, and it's just taking all of it, and it's just going through it and turning it into that image that you saw. So that's what I'm calling data-oriented programming. And uh, so why is it better than what you saw before? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> no, I do not. Um, so first of all, one thing that jumps out at me maybe jumps out at you is that the data-oriented way, you can actually see the hierarchy. Like, I, the object-oriented way had a hierarchy. It had that little add method and whatnot. But you can actually see it here. Like, just look at the indentation. You can see what is the parent of what. When you're using plain old arrays, the same arrays your dad and his dad used, or whatever, uh, <laughs> you can, all you gotta do is use square brackets, curly braces. That's it. Uh, you don't have to learn uh, a whole new API with classes and, uh, and methods inside of them. You already know how to use an array. If you know JavaScript, you learned it on day one, day two. That's all it is, just arrays and little object literals everywhere. So you already know how to use data. And that's one of the advantages of it as well. Also, it's pure, like I just said. There's no mutation going on here. Uh, all we're doing is generating data. Um, so the fact that there's no, no mutation at least makes it possible for us to be more functional. So, what else is cool about data? Oh, uh, you can serialize that. So if you ever wanted to take that and just like save it to the disk or send it over a network, there's a function there's json.stringify. Just give that commands variable to it and it'll just give you a big string and save it to the disk send it over the network, tweet it. I don't know. I don't know why you would, but like you can do anything you want with it, and then someone can grab it, parse it, give it to that render function, and boom, they can display it. Like, it's so flexible. This stuff right here, like, uh, you might be able to serialize that. Um, this is going to be a lot more difficult. And, and again, just squint. Like, don't really read it. Uh, <coughs> Just like squint at it, you'll notice no actual like visual hierarchy in the code. It's all it's just a flat vertical line. Uh, when you're using data literals like this, you can actually see the structure of the thing you're trying to draw. Yep, question? Another advantage with this that you can write a game that can change its own code. Yeah. In gameplay, you can go in and change this similarly. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, that's the thing. This is my favorite part, is that if this is all you're doing now to draw things, you can do whatever you want at this point, right before the render. You can go back to here and just change it. You just walk through it. And again, if you know JavaScript, you already know how to do that, because it's just an array, it's just an object. You can just peer into it and grab whatever you want, and, and change whatever you want. If you don't want it to be yellow, just uh, 
reach into that command center and won't change it before you render. So the downside, I mean, it does look kind of ugly. Uh, JavaScript is not necessarily meant to be written this way. And, uh, you know, this is, a, this is the kind of thing, if I did this, this is the kind of thing I get my wrist slapped with a ruler. You know, don't do that. You need to make a class for all of that. And, uh, you know, I listened. I didn't do that. And uh, at some point, if something feels right, but everyone's telling you not to do it, you got two choices. You, you follow the pack, or you say goodbye and take your ball and go home, you know? Which in this case means uh, using a different language. So um, the only language I've come across where this style of programming is actually uh, normal and not ugly and not considered uh, bad is uh, Clojure and Clojure Script by extension, which is the same thing but runs in the browser. So what does this look like in Clojure and Clojure Script? Looks like that. It actually looks pretty similar. Um, you know, a little bit different, no commas. Uh, we got these things to start with a colon, that's called a keyword. It's just the same as a string, but lighter weight. Um, but other than that, it looks the same. I mean, it's got the same structure. The render function has a parenthesis on the left side. That's going to freak some people out. But other than that, um, the, the rest of this actually looks pretty similar. The, the difference is that in this language, this is normal. Like, this is uh, not going to get you, you know, uh, made fun of for doing it. And, uh, and actually, this is valid code. This is uh, a library that I'm writing right now. Uh, called Play CLJS, and what it's doing is it's uh, building this data veneer on top of that P5JS library that I just mentioned earlier. So it's uh, it's hope I'm hoping to allow you to write games like that. And um, I want to definitely show off some actual code um, because just staring at the background of this game is not necessarily going to do it for you. That, that, there's where uh, it is on the internet. If you want to look, check it out. It's very new. Uh, it's it's going to change a lot. I'm going to break everything. But um, that, that at least is like the idea that I'm trying to get across here. And um, now I just want to just change the code a little bit just to show you some of the advantages that I was talking about before, I want to make it a little more palpable. And when I'm done with that, um, you guys obviously ask questions. So let me, or you can stop me anytime now and ask questions. So um, this is my editor. This is the actual game itself. And um, oh, that should look familiar. That's the smiley. That's that smiley, except now it's, it's Really colorful. Do you like how it uh, is distracting? I do. So, um, so that's the smiley. And then if I scroll down, obviously you don't need to read or understand everything here. But <coughs> looking at there, the actual slides that I wrote, and as you can see, I'm defining them with that same kind of syntax that I talked about before. It's literally just data. In this case, it's a little command called text, and. Uh, do other things. So, um, what I want to do, I don't have a huge amount of actual live code to do, but first of all, actually, before I even try to mess with the code, um, I do want to show time rewinding. I know this is totally cheesy and stupid, but um, it, uh, it's kind of fun. So, yeah, I mentioned that was one of the things that is really easy to do with functional programming, right? It's rewinding time. Why is that? Why? Why was that third style more conducive to time rewinding? It, it plays into that concept I'm telling you about, the, about um, the fact that we don't directly mutate data. And as a result, uh, if we go back to our little model bear, there isn't a whole lot of data I have to store for this game. Uh, there weren't any bad guys. I wanted to, but I figured that would kill my flow. That's what I'm going, it's like bad guy funny. But, uh, I mean, at the very least, I need to store the XY position of this dude. 
And in object-oriented or procedural programming, you have some little data structure you store that in, and you just bang on it, you just mutate it every time you want to move them. Well, I can't do that with functional programming. Uh, I need to create an entirely new structure with a new xy value. And I can discard the old one, but what I chose to do here was not discard it. I chose to actually save it. So every single frame where I'm walking, I'm actually uh, saving the old data structure with this, uh, you know, XY position, all that, um, and then replacing it with the new one. So over time, as I'm playing this, this data structure is growing. Uh, and it just contains basically every frame of data. That's very easy to do with functional programming. Um, you have to work a lot harder if you're not using immutable data because. Uh, you, you, you no longer have the old x, y value, you mutated it, it's gone. So uh, I, I wrote a, a tiny bit of code that just says, if I hold on to the space bar, rewind it. And so that's what I'm doing. And all that's really happening here is it's grabbing it from that history variable that I created, and it's uh, rendering with whatever state was in there instead of in the new one. So, uh, let me go a little bit further. You may wonder, like, what does that code actually look like? The actual time rewinding code is right here. So, it doesn't matter if you know closure or not. That doesn't look like very much code, right? It's just a, it's a pretty small chunk of code. It's, it's, it's one variable and two functions. Um, that, and I wrote it two hours ago because uh, I forgot I needed that for this. Um, so I, I got one function here called rewind, which uh, actually listens for that spacebar. And if you're pressing it, it will actually reach into your history variable, get the last value out, and return it, and also remove it from that history variable so that the next time I run the same function, it will get the, the next earlier little chunk of data, all right? Uh, and then start recording is exactly what it sounds like. I run that when the game first starts, and uh, and it listens for any change in state. That's what that ad watch thing is doing. It's saying anytime that koala bear's state is changing, uh, I want to I want to add it to the history. So the point is, it's not hard to do it because of the fact that uh, the the uh, this style of programming makes it very simple. Um, as I mentioned, it's also very easy to do hot code reloading. So this is a browser-based game, if it wasn't obvious. Uh, and I, I'm a big proponent now of, of starting there. If you're interested in game development, Unity is great, but GDX, that kind of stuff is great. But um, I, would, I would say start with browser, honestly, because um, you can make a game and put it on a web server and someone can just click a link and start playing it. And if, early on especially, you need to get good feedback from people. If they need to download an .exe file, a jar file, something like that, just to play your game, you lost like 80% of your audience. Um, I mean, I'm not going to download it. I mean, I don't know what's in it. With browsers, you've got the sandbox, the safe uh, security sandbox, and I'm lazy, if it wasn't obvious. I don't want to download your game and install it. Uh, but with this, you can just click a link. Um, so in order to get that hot, hot code reloading to work, what's going on is, um, at least with Clojure, I'm running this little command uh, here. And what's happening is, every single time I make any change to the code, it senses it. And then it recompiles it, and it actually shoots it to the browser over this special network connection. So uh, I can just make any change I want, and it should be reflected pretty much instantly. So light blue, that's the background, right? So if I just change that to red, and uh, rate a little bit. I mean, I didn't do anything there. I didn't even hit save, because it auto saves. So um, that kind of hot code reloading is, uh, is really good for experimentation. Now, where am I in this level? I'm, I'm right next to the Create the Smiley. 
So here again, like, with, if you just want to mess around with a game, I, like I said, a lot of good ideas come only when you're just playing around. You just like, you don't really have any goal in mind. Just playing around. It's the same with any kind of uh, art form, uh, music, for example. Uh, you know, it's totally normal for a musician to just riff on an instrument and to come up with ideas. They're not always, you know, proceeding with some plan uh, that they worked on before. It's the same exact thing with game development. Um, if we can, if we can make it easier to just mess around, um, then you can, you know, be the game developer equivalent of Paul Simon, just sitting in his little bathroom, riff on his guitar, boom. Sound of silence, <laughs> just like that. I'm not saying you're the next Paul Simon. I might be. <laughs> um, so yeah, like like for example, all right, this is a stupid idea, but uh, I want more than one smiley. I just want like tons of smileys. Um, because this is just data, I can use the same kind of stuff that I've used in Closure to like create. Uh, a, a list of data instead of just one thing. So it, if you've done uh, anything like JavaScript, you probably messed around with for loops. Uh, I'm just going to make one that goes 10 times, okay? And I'm going to move this little smiley thingy inside of there, and I want to make one change, which is the x position here is going to be uh, i times 100, which basically means whatever the i variable is, X position is going to be that times 100. And it's going to do it 10 times. So what I think should happen, we should get 10 little creepy smiles. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's still not really interesting because um, they're all yellow. I don't like yellow. Uh, OK, so here's where I'm saying it's yellow. So one thing you can do, I just know this because I wrote this library. You don't actually have to give it like, the color name. You can actually give it RGB values. Red, green, blue, something like that. So I'm going to do that, and I want to randomly generate them. And I think 256 is, is the highest. No, 0 to 255. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Just keep watching. OK, so now what's happening is I'm just randomly generating those values, and actually the weird part is, I think, each time I change it, it's going to change the colors. Oh, that's going to really freak me out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, you know, you're not going to win any game, indie game awards with that. But, you know, it's a start. So the, the basic idea is um, that that whole idea of just messing around, coming up with stupid ideas and trying it, all of a sudden you don't feel inhibited by it if the tools you're using are, I give you a direct connection to the game that's running. No need to restart it, no need to uh, set up the state of the program again. My guy didn't have to restart the beginning of the level. How stupid would that be if every time I'd make a change I had to like walk over there? Um, again, these are possible and imperative languages, but uh, much more difficult. So, um, to me, that's the most important thing. It's not being bug free. Um, we all get bugs. It's great. It's, um, it keeps us employed, actually. Think about it. <laughs> um, so, it, it's this it's that direct connection to the game that, uh, that really, to me, uh, makes this style of programming really great. And the fact that no one is doing it right now in game development means that you can. You can crush them with whatever game you make. I mean, it's not that easy, but I, you know, you can make yourself think it is. So, um, I could keep doing live coding all day, but I don't want to take up any more time. So, if anyone has any questions, love to field them. That's all I got. Thank you. Pretty sure the universe will explode. <laughs> ah. 
That's what happens. He's just a super Yeah, that's actually really bizarre. <laughs> it's like they're fighting each other. <laughs> I, uh, I did give it one feature, which is when I hit P, it can pause it. And it actually pauses the state of the game. Uh, so, like, nothing is happening. I mean, technically the game loop is still running, but nothing is happening. And uh, that's useful, kind of, because then you can go into the little REPL thingy, which I didn't really show, and you can just look at the state right now. So that, like, Y value right there, not that one, the one below it, that's his actual Y value right now. And then if I unpause it, it's exactly the same <laughs> Y value. See? No, I don't know. I don't really know. Do it now. There we go. The Y value changed. See, I was aligned. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, you can turn that into a game mechanic, I'm sure. That's my point. You can just like come across bizarre behaviors and uh, and decide I'm gonna design a game around it, and then no one will play it, and you'll be depressed. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Like I said, this is on uh, GitHub. Uh, I'm not sure if it's still there. Let's see. There it is. So it's on my GitHub. So. No, that was that was legit closure code, but it's not actually doing a mutation. That little for loop there is uh, designed to look like an imperative for loop, but underneath it's actually doing a map operation. Um, it's it's uh, very similar to using um, map with a little lambda, but um, which you can also do in closure. But this is slightly more uh, familiar looking to people who use like. JavaScript or something, but in, in reality, this for loop, all it's doing is, is uh, generating a list of, in this case, 10 uh, little pieces of data, and, uh, and so this whole thing is just one big data structure that I'm shoving into that, that special little rend render function that I alluded to before. That's, that's practically the only function in this library, the rest is just data. You mentioned that you use the term live, I'm live coding right now, and there's, as it sounds like you know already, in the computer music community, this is live coding way of doing things, where you have a person coding a musical piece online yeah. in front of an audience. So, how, is, is this happening in game development, where you may have a couple of developers, three developers, like with Google Drive, where you share one document? Mm bring two or three developers kind of messing with the same code. And each person is using their own little laptop with its own behavior. And that becomes part of, it's a meta game yeah. of live coding a game. That is my next startup idea. <laughs> uh, I, uh, no, I mean, I, I haven't heard of people uh, doing it um, a lot. Um, this environment is, is almost ready for it. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, no, um, I, I mean, the, the only tricky technical issue is uh, what happens when one person breaks the code. And also, you, you know, you get into the whole merge conflict thing. Someone changed the same line of code you did, and like, uh, but I, I do like the idea in general. Um, it works really well for, like you mentioned, with music. Uh, and oddly enough, uh, Clojure is the language that a lot of people use that for. Uh, if you've ever looked at Overtone and various, various other closure libraries, uh, people use them to live code music, which works very well. I mean, if you two people, you know, doing it at the same time, you're not going to get necessarily the, the technical issues you'll get with trying to code on a game. But, um, you know, there are a ton of possibilities, and I'm sure that sort of thing would work really well, especially uh, with web games, you know, because it's 
you just have a bunch of people connected together. Same one. No other questions? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.